Hi everyone and welcome to this Orbex market analysis session. I'm James Hart. Okay, so we're just a week out now from the German elections and as ever with these key political events which have the power to directly impact markets, we always like to give you a detailed analysis of the situation and highlight any potential trading opportunities and trading risks to make sure that you are trading with the best possible information. So in this session, we're going to talk through the key details of the 2017 German elections and then also look at the potential market implications. So if you have any questions during the presentation, please just write them in the chat box and I'll stop periodically to answer them and then also leave some time at the end. OK, so let's kick off then by looking at the main parties in this year's election for any of you who aren't familiar with the German parties. So first of all, then we have the CDU. Now, this is Germany's main centre right party. It was formed in 1950 after World War Two and developed out of the centre right party at the time, which dated back to 1870. So at the core of the CDU's ideology is a belief in conservative social values and a social market economy, which is essentially a free market which also focuses on social equity. The party also supports European integration as well as a membership of NATO. Now in terms of the typical support for the party, the key demographic tends to be the Catholic population in southwest and western regions of Germany, though there is growing support among those with different religious beliefs as well as non-religious persons. The party is led by current German Chancellor Angela Merkel. We then have the CSU, which is the CDU's sister party, so you'll often see the CDU and the CSU listed together. And the two tend to be in agreement on most issues, although the CSU is typically more socially conservative than the CDU. Now, although the party is a national party, it actually only stands for office in Bavaria, where it was founded in 1945 and has governed the area since 1949, except for three years over 1950 to 1953 and the party is led by Horst Seehofer. OK, so we then have the SPD, which was developed out of the labour movement of the 19th century and began as a Marxist party. Now, this party was founded in 1875, which makes it Germany's oldest political party. It's traditionally been supported by working class voters, with the majority of its support coming from the bigger Protestant cities in the north of Germany and industrial cities of the Ruhr. However, over recent years, it has made more effort to engage the middle class. Now, the key focus points of the SPD are social democracy, a social market economy, a welfare state, civil rights and European integration. Now, importantly, up until the last 10 years, the SPD had actually been the biggest party in Germany, but they saw their support falling away in the early 2000s as the left party flourished in popularity. The party is led by Martin Schulz and is currently part of the grand coalition with the CDU CSU. So the SPD is actually currently in government with the CDU and CSU. The election of Schultz as a leader is an important moment for the party as it notes them taking a more modern approach, embracing social media in a bid to win the votes of the younger electorate. We then have the FDP, which was founded in 1948 and is a liberal party which is focused on both economic and social liberalism, having shifted from its origins as a centre-right party. The FDP has typically been the junior party in coalitions formed with the two major parties, the CDU and the SPD, and due to this fact, it's actually been in government more than any other party in Germany. 
In terms of policies, the FDP are in favour of the European project and support European integration, but also believe that Europe needs to become federalised and decentralised. Oh, and uh, I should have changed the title there to say the Greens, but the Green Party was established in 1993 and is actually listed as the Bundini's 90 and the Green Party, and they were formed out of a merger between the Green Party and the German Alliance 90. So this new party is led by Simone Peter and Kem Oetstimmer, and traditionally the party has been focused on issues of environmentalism and pacifism. However, it's important to note that pacifism faded as a priority when the party entered into a coalition government with the SPD in 1998, as the party backed the bombing of Kosovo and later the US attack on Afghanistan. In terms of policies then, the party's key focus areas now are alternative energy, sustainable development and green transport. And the main support for the party is typically found among higher income urban professionals. OK, we then move on to Die Linke, which is a relatively new party. It was formed in 2007 when the PDS, the Party Democratic Socialism, merged with breakaway members of the SPD and trade unionists. So the party, which is actually the country's fourth largest, is also the country's most left wing party. And in terms of policy, their focus has been on traditional leftist ideals, such as neutralizing capitalism, increasing government spending, and increasing taxation on corporations and high earners. In terms of support, the party's main backing comes from the older generations, and the party is led by Sara Wagenknecht. And finally, we have the AFD, the Alternative for Deutschland. Now, this party was formed in April 2013 and actually shot into focus in German politics when they won 4.7 percent of the votes in the 2013 federal election, only just missing the 5 percent threshold needed to take seats in the Bundestag. Now, the party is strongly Eurosceptic and they propose a German exit from the EU if they gain power. They've largely built their support base off the growing discontent over recent years with the rising level of migrants arriving in Germany and have capitalised on European terror attacks to bolster their support base. OK, so those are the main parties then. So now you need to know who is in the lead heading into the elections. And the best way to get a gauge of this is to consider the polling results. Obviously, there are various poll making companies taking polling results across Germany periodically in the run up to the elections. And using a polling tracker such as the one on the Telegraph website, we're able to get an average of these different polling results to give us the best overview of the main support backing these candidates. So, as you can see, the latest polls show that the CDU the party of the incumbent Chancellor, Angela Merkel, have a comfortable double digit lead over the second place party, the SPD. Now, this comes as no surprise, really, because German politics has typically been dominated by these two parties who have also been in a coalition government together since 2013. Now, although the two share fairly indistinguishable platforms, the results of this coalition has been political gridlock as the opposing parties have failed to pass any significant policies during their term in government. Now, because these parties, these two parties rather, are widely expected to take the first and second place, much more focus this year is being placed on the third place because this party will take seats in the Bundestag and will also form the main opposition to the government. So currently the two parties fighting it out for third place are the far left party, Die Linke, and the far right party, AFD, Alternative for Germany. 
So, with the CDU widely expected to take control of government once again or to be part of a coalition in government, it's important to highlight what it is that is making Angela Merkel's campaign so successful. And really the backbone of Angela Merkel and the CDU, CSU's campaign has been the strong German economy. So we've seen GDP growth on course for 2% in 2017. Unemployment has been at a record low of 5.6%, alongside strengthening consumer confidence and private consumption. Alongside this, we've also seen the German government achieving a budget surplus of 18.3 billion euros, while public debt remains at the low level of 67% of GDP. Now, it's fair to say that Angela Merkel has also benefited from external factors during her campaign, such as the election of Donald Trump as US president, as well as the dissipation in the refugee crisis which escalated in Germany over 2015, 2016, and saw Merkel coming under intense public scrutiny. So the shift in sentiment back towards Merkel is clear with the latest poll by Infratest DMAP reporting that 52% of those polled would prefer Merkel as chancellor over just 30% for Schulz who was beaten by the incumbent in categories such as leadership skills, trustworthiness and likability. So this is an important piece of data then um, supporting the view of the market, which is that Angela Merkel is highly likely to resume her role as the Chancellor. So we touched then a moment ago on the importance of the third place. We talked about the fact that this party is likely to take seats, this party will rather take seats in the Bundestag and likely receive a boost in support. Now, at the moment, the AFD and Die Linke parties are fighting it out, but the majority of focus seems to be on the prospect of the AFD party taking third place. Now, this is particularly noteworthy because since the start of the year, there's been a high level of concern surrounding the growing wave of populist support that has emerged across the Eurozone. And in Germany, this support is backing the AFD, who narrowly missed taking seats in the Bundestag in 2013. So if they do succeed in taking seats this time, it's likely to provide a significant boost for their support base, as they'll be far more in the spotlight in terms of German politics. And this could, of course, create problems down the line at the next elections. Now, although it's fair to say that this campaign has been decidedly dull and even uneventful compared to the recent political campaigns, which we saw ahead of the Brexit referendum in the UK or in the run up to the US presidential elections and even the recent UK and French general elections, there is still one element which poses the risk for a surprise outcome once again here, and that is the high level of undecided voters. So a recent survey revealed that around 46% of those polled said that they were still undecided with regard to who they would be voting for in this election. And obviously, this is a very large number and could, of course, have significant consequences on the polling results. However, it's important to note that the base case scenario is for the CDU and the SPD to take the top two places. And given the current polling results, it would take nearly all of the 46 percent undecided voters voting for one of the smaller parties to cause a dramatic upset. So now you know the background to the elections then, as well as the current polling results ahead of them and the key aspects that have been in focus. Let's talk about the potential trading implications from, from these elections and the impact that they could have on the market. So the first thing to note is that given that Germany is the largest economy in the Eurozone, clearly the political landscape in this country is key to the stability of the Eurozone and the euro. Now, typically, as you would expect, the euro responds negatively to any increase in potential risk to the stability of the eurozone and then responds positively 
to any dissipation in this risk or the absence of this risk. Now, this dynamic was very clear during the French elections, where the euro tended to trade lower on reports that the far right candidate Marine Le Pen was gaining support, but then ultimately traded higher as the neoliberal Macron won the presidency. And this is a dynamic which we saw playing out week after week with the French elections. Now, just as we saw here with the German polling results, one of the key input to the price action over the French elections was the release almost on a weekly basis of polling results. So anytime these polling results showed a boost in support for Le Pen, who was in favour of exiting the euro in the eurozone, then the euro te itself tended to trade lower because, again, there was an increased um, risk to the stability of the eurozone. So this is what we're seeing here now with the German elections. Because Angela Merkel is widely expected to win and she's in favour of staying in the eurozone and the CDU are not likely to rock the boat, then for now the euro seems to be fairly stable. So with this in mind then, there's unlikely to be much impact on the euro from these German elections and there's unlikely to be any downside pressure at least. However, as Angela Merkel's party is not expected to achieve an outright majority, the key to determining the effect on, of the election on the euro will be engaging the potential coalitions. And this itself could create some volatility. OK, so because the CDU are not expected to take an outright majority, it's likely that they'll have to form a government with another party or other parties. And the composition of this coalition is what could ultimately have an effect on the euro. So let's take a look at some potential um, coalitions and the impact that they could have on the markets. So first off, then, if we see, as is widely expected, another CDU SPD coalition, well, this would simply continue or maintain rather the status quo and ultimately further the political deadlock which has stifled German politics over the last four years. And although the terms gridlock and stifled you'd think would be a negative thing, in terms of euro price action, this would likely be a bullish signal for euro markets because it would simply mean the passing of another key eurozone election without a far right euro skeptic party gaining power. So this would minimise any risk to the stability of the eurozone and maintain stability, keeping the ECB on course to begin their shift back towards policy normalisation, as is widely expected, given recent signals by the bank. So if this is the case and we do see a CDU SPD coalition, then the euro is likely to remain buoyant as are euro markets. Now, another potential coalition then is the CDU, FDP and Green Party coalition. And this could be slightly different as we could see a coalition of this sort, which is often referred to as a Jamaica coalition due to the colours of the party's flags. This combination could weigh on the euro because although it would likely support business and growth, striking a balance between liberal views and business policies, the coalition would likely be against deeper EU integration, and this could put downside pressure on the euro. But important to highlight then, as we've said, or to reiterate rather, that the base case scenario, which is widely expected by markets and encouraged by recent polling results, is that the CDU and SPD will simply enter into another coalition. And so the status quo will remain the same in German politics. OK, so now that we've got all the details behind the elections, let's take a look at the charts and have a run through how the euro and the DAX could be affected by these polling results. Uh, sorry, by the election results. OK, so kicking off with the euro then and looking at the bigger picture of the euro, you can see that over the last 10 years, price has been moving in this long term bearish channel. And over the last two years, after touching the bottom of the bearish channel in 2015, you can see that we've put in a triple bottom at this level and then we've since recently started to turn higher. Now, the rally over this year, which has been a significant rally, you can see it's of a similar trajectory to the type of rallies that we've seen 
in the last upward moves in the euro over the last 10 years has taken price above some key resistance levels. So we've broken above the 2015 2016 swing highs around the 117 level. And we've also broken out above the 38.2% retracement from the 2014 highs. So this has been a really significant rally, which so far hasn't really had any sort of pullback. So the rally has taken us all the way up to the current level, uh, sorry, the current high around 12030s. And you can see that this was the 2012 low. So this was a major low in the euro. You can see after setting off from the 2010 highs, we traded all the way down to this level and then almost turned on a dime before reversing sharply higher. So this was a really big support level in the euro, which once broken in 2014 has taken three years to trade back up and test. And you can see that if we zoom in on this just a little bit, you can see that as we tested that level for the first time, price was rejected sharply and sent lower by around 200 pips. So this is now a really key resistance level in the euro. So the first level that we're going to be looking for in terms of an upside level is again another test of this 12030 level, which was the 2012 lows. So if the current gridlock in German politics persists, and if we see the CDU and SPD gaining power and forming another coalition government, then this is likely to keep the euro supported and will keep focus on upside levels. However, we aren't likely to see much of a rally because, as I say, this is widely expected and so largely priced into the market at this point. What we will see happen is trading focus return to the underlying fundamentals. And of course, the most important event that we have coming up in the next couple of months is the October ECB meeting. So if the German elections pass as expected, with Merkel regaining her role as the chancellor and the CDU SPD entering into a coalition, then markets are likely to remain in this stagnant sort of range bound period ahead of the October ECB. Now, if the ECB do announce further tapering, which they are widely expected to do, then at that point, we're likely to see a rally higher. And so the first level we'll be looking at to the top side then will be this level, 121.79. And this is the 50% retracement from those 2014 highs. So you can see that at the top of this rally, we stalled just ahead of that level, retesting that 2012 low before turning lower. Now, if we do see the ECB announcing tapering after the German elections, then we are likely to see a pop higher and challenge that level. So sticking with this theme of further upside then, which would look to be on course if the ECB does move back towards normalising its policy, then the next key level we'd have to look at would be all the way up here at around 126.16. And this might seem quite far away at the moment. It's roughly five or six hundred pips away. But if you look at the sort of movement we've seen in the euro over the last few months, you can see that we really could be up in that zone quite quickly. And this level, the 126.16, is a key level because not only do we have this raft of broken lows here, so you can see that back around December of 2012 into around uh, June and July of 2013, we had a raft of broken lows sitting just above it. But it's also the 61.8% retracement from the 2014 highs. And then we also have the resistance trend line of that long term bearish channel. So this is going to be a really key zone for the euro. And to be honest, when we first test this level, we're likely to see some selling pressure kick in as this is a major long term technical level. So it could be that we trade back up to this level, test it and then come back down before ultimately going on to either break it or starting the next turn lower within this long term bearish channel. Now, although it's clearly not expected and there is a very low likelihood of it happening, given the high level of undecided voters, it is worth considering what might be the case if we do see a surprise outcome in the election and we do see something like the far right party coming into power or one of the less likely coalitions being formed. And if that is the case, then, of course, what we're likely to see is the euro trading sharply lower. And the first level we'd have to look at for support and the level which is likely to be a key pivot for the euro 
is going to be this 117 level where we have a retest of the 38.2% retracement from 2014 highs, as well as the retest of these 2015, 2016 swing highs. And as I say, given the trajectory and the momentum of this current rally, it is worth noting that we haven't seen a proper pullback yet. And so it would be in the context of a typical technical move to see a retracement in this rally, such as we saw at this point here or at this point here. So if we do see some sort of upset, then the euro is likely to pull back into this level and then this will become a key pivot. Obviously, if we can hold a retest of this level and focus stays on the October ECB meeting, then we are likely to then again at some point see a leg higher. However, if price breaks back down below that 117 level, below these 2015 and 2016 highs, then that's obviously going to see a lot of short squaring, their, a lot of long squaring their positions rather, a lot of trailing stops hit, and then a lot of short plays coming into the market. And we could see a rotation lower, giving us a much deeper correction. But as I say, for now, the base case scenario is for a positive outcome in the German elections, keeping focus on the October ECB meeting and keeping focus on further upside. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the DAX, which you can see is clearly reflecting the optimism or rather the lack of concern around the German elections. You can see that price has been trading in a tight bullish channel over this year. We broke out above the 2015 high around the 12, 30, 81 mark. And then since then, you can see that we've simply been chopping around. But it's important to note that we have recently broken back above it. So if the German elections pass as expected, this will maintain the status quo in Germany, supporting the current business and trading environment. And the DAX then is likely to return to trading off the standard fundamental picture of an improving economic picture in Germany and also the wider Eurozone. However, it is important to note again that the most important catalyst coming up in the Euro landscape is the October ECB meeting. And obviously, if we do see tapering announced by the ECB, then the DAX is likely to not experience the same upside as the euro and likely to cause some downside momentum. And to the downside, the key flag for a bearish move will obviously be a break of this rising trend line. So at this point, we've put in a high, we've sold off and made a reaction low, we've hit that rising trend line support, we then traded back up. So what we could potentially see forming here is a lower high in place. And then the confirmation of that lower high would be a break of the current August low around 11843. And if we get a break there, then of course, we need to start looking at deeper levels. And the next key resistance, key support rather, would be back into this base of broken highs around 10836 mark. And then again, this would be supported by the idea that the ECB is going to announce tapering and we're going to see European equities trading lower as the euro itself starts to trade higher. OK, guys, so that's the rundown ahead of the 2017 German elections. I hope that you found that information useful and that you feel up to date ahead of the event next week and best of luck trading it. So before I wrap up today, then, are there any questions that I can answer for anyone? Great. OK. OK. Well, thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks for tuning in today. And I'm pleased you're able to follow along and found that useful. And I look forward to catching up with you all next time. All the best. Thank you.